Hello, I'm Lisa Ling. This is the Road to a Vaccine, an exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the community's efforts to uh, develop a vaccine against the disease. Last week, I did our broadcast while quarantined in a hotel in Oklahoma. I had gone there to film a show and got exposed to someone who later tested positive for COVID. After the requisite number of days in quarantine, I have tested negative and am happy to be back home. But this whole experience really has been a stark reminder of how pervasive this virus is and that we still have a long way to go. Let's take a look at the current numbers in the U.S. and globally. We are currently at almost 43 million global cases with over 8.6 million in the US and over 1.1 million deaths globally. Europe is deep into a second wave. Spain has declared a state of emergency and Italy, France and the UK have imposed curfews in an attempt to control their spikes. On Friday, both Wales and Ireland returned to lockdown similar to the ones we saw in April. And over the weekend, France registered over 52,000 new coronavirus cases in one day. And here in the US, there were over 74,000 new cases reported just yesterday. And over the past week, an average of 71,000 cases per day as the virus continues to devastate states in the American heartland. Wisconsin alone reported more than 4,000 new cases over the weekend. A lot of numbers, and we have some incredible guests to help put all of this in context. First, we have Dr. Eric Topol from Scripps Research. He'll explain why COVID is more than just a respiratory issue. It can also cause severe heart damage. Then Dr. Mathai Mammon from J&J will tell us about the status of their vaccine candidate. And Nurse Alice Benjamin will paint a picture of what it's like for patients and healthcare providers in emergency rooms right now. We are coming to you live, so please feel uh, free to submit questions, and we will try to get them answered today. Our first guest is Dr. Eric Topol, world-renowned cardiologist and professor of molecular medicine at Scripps Research. He's also a best-selling author and one of the top 10 most cited researchers in medicine. Dr. Topol, it is such a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, you have said that we are headed into the worst phase yet of the American pandemic. Do you expect we'll have the same level of hospitalizations and deaths as, as we did months ago? Well, first, Lisa, it's great to be with you. And I'm so sorry that you also were a victim of COVID and glad you're doing well now, my goodness. The uh, issue that we're facing now is we have had just one mega wave uh, and we're watching, as you pointed out in Europe, where it's going through a, a very tough second wave whereby you know, countries are facing the need for lockdown, which, as you mentioned, has occurred in Ireland and Wales, but other countries are likely to follow suit, as did Israel recently, successfully, likely to follow suit, as did Israel recently, successfully. But uh, it's a dire situation because the weather's getting colder, people are moving indoors, and it's following suit from 100 one years ago with the 1918 pandemic when the second wave was even worse than the first. The good part is the deaths haven't been as high so far. They're going up and in, in the U.S. as well right now. But what we are seeing is a big spike in hospitalizations. And as you, we know that it's uh, Utah, they're already rationing care. Uh, other places are really having a tough time in the U.S. And we're just about to take another big jump. As you know, Friday and Saturday uh, data from the days prior, two days prior, was 83,000 new confirmed infections, which we know is just the tip of the iceberg. It's at least fivefold that you know, for real because we don't do enough testing. So we have not even gotten into the second wave, which is the equivalent of Europe as we move into colder weather. The fatality rate is going down with drug uh, treatments, with um, proning with blood thinners, uh, we're just getting better. And the people who are the most vulnerable are staying home. So we are learning a little bit to cope with this, but that's just perhaps explaining a lesser fatality rate, but certainly there's gonna be a lot of sick people in the hospital. We may indeed get back to the 2000 deaths per day average that we saw in April. Uh, and especially since we aren't adopting the universal mass and uh, the, the avoidance of, of crowds and all the things that we should be doing that are, it's just befuddling. It's just crazy that we're not uh, getting much more serious and aggressive. Yeah, as I mentioned, I was in Oklahoma and I was just 
quite astounded by how many people just flat out refuse to wear masks. And we talk about Europe, uh, so many countries are locking down, uh, yet our cases uh, exceed those of all of those countries in Europe. Do you foresee us going through or having to go through another period of lockdown in certain parts of this country? Well, I, I kind of quipped about that on Twitter about the L word because it's so, there's such severe antibodies to a lockdown. But, um, you know, I think what is clear in Europe where they got containment, they got it down to, you know, 10 per million cases in most of the countries because they really had a mask mandate with serious fines. I mean, they took this really aggressively, whereas as you're pointing out, we don't have this, even in states, the worst state in the country right now in North Dakota, there still isn't a mask mandate. And it is at a point where it's well over a thousand new confirmed infections uh, per million a day. Uh, so th it's th there in the Czech Republic are the two hottest uh, zones of COVID in the world right now. So it's just amazing that we don't get aggressive. Of course, we have problems at, at the very top with leadership that have been in denial for so many months, and that doesn't help. But uh, the, there are many simple, non-tech, low-cost things that we can do to turn this around. Yeah, the, the, the politicization of masks is just, it continues to just be so confounding. Um, now, in the new sci uh, issue of Science Magazine, you explained that COVID-19 can directly and indirectly induce cardiac damage. Many people assume that COVID is only a respiratory problem. Can you talk about exactly what kind of damage it can do to the heart and why some people may be more at risk? Yeah, I mean, I think this is something we've learned. I mean, every day we're learning something about uh, COVID, but the heart involvement is the real deal. Uh, fortunately, it isn't common in young, healthy people, but it does occur. And we've seen it in athletes. We've even seen uh, sudden deaths because of the arrhythmias. Basically what happens here is that the virus can either directly get into the heart cells because they, like the lung, have very high of the ACE2 expression. And, and the virus seeks ACE2 throughout the body and gets to many other parts, but the heart has particular propensity. So it can get in the cells and hijack the cells, but it also can lead to inflammation and immune uh, uh, response to heart cells. And that is any part of the heart, the muscle, uh, the conduction disturbances that can occur. Uh, so we see this array of things, anything from inflammation of the heart known as myocarditis to cardiomyopathy, which is a weakened heart muscle, uh, and even simulating a heart attack. Uh, that is the invasion of the blood vessels, the lining of the blood vessels, uh, endotheolitis. So this is a diverse uh, type of thing that can happen to people. We've seen it happen in people without symptoms, even no less people with mild symptoms. And so there are many viruses that can infect the heart and affect the heart. But because this is so diffusely uh, pervasive, as you pointed out, Lisa, with over 40 million people, even if it's 0.5%, it's still gonna hit a lot of people. And so right now, we don't know enough about this. That is, do people who have inflammation of their heart, do they recover? How long does it take? Uh, we know some people with long COVID, long haulers have heart involvement, and that's part of their symptom complex. But there's so much that's not known, and we really need to get our arms around it. So we're talking about the potential of long-term damage to the heart with this. Yes, that is, if you have enough damage from inflammation of the heart, you can not just have a bruise that uh, heals and, re and you fully recover, but you can develop this cardiomyopathy, which is just a generalized weakness of the heart and heart failure. And we have seen this. I mean, it, there's many cases now of people with very severe heart muscle uh, weakness. So um, it, it's a very tough matter because we don't even have a sense of how common it is. And most importantly, why certain people? That is, you know, why young, healthy people might be susceptible? We don't have a clue yet about why that is occurring. 
that's the thing, you know, it seems like we've been living with this virus for so long, yet there still is so much that, that we don't know that we are learning about this virus. Uh, Dr. Topol, I, I recently took a commercial flight and, and I was surprised, I was shocked that it was completely full, even middle seats. As we head into this, what, what's been called the third surge, it seems like things like travel and schools are, are to a certain extent, going back to normal, but, uh, you know, with, with mask requirements. What are your thoughts on this? Well, you know, there again, the data are mixed. Um, you know, yesterday there was a report of a flight that went from the Middle East to Ireland and it led to a super spreader event. And it was only 17% full on the plane. But it just so happened it was bad luck because several people on that plane had COVID and uh, unwittingly it led to you know all sorts of secondary attacks. So you could be on a plane that's full, but everybody on it is you know in good shape without ability to as a carrier. And then you could be on a flight that is barely um, full. I mean you know one in five seats only. And then it's a long flight, which adds to the that was a seven hour flight. So. The same thing with schools, you know, certain places, whether it's, uh, you know, schools, uh, you know, young children or all the way up to universities, they've managed this well. They're in communities where the spread is in a very low level. And then others have had just a, uh, an awful time with lots of spread of infections. So, you know, the problem here again is um, if we had rapid tests that were done at home, and everybody had this, which we should by now. And you just knew if you were infectious, you took the test you, in 10 minutes or 15 minutes, you got the answer. You then put it on your phone so that you could go. You had a passport for the day, whether it was to go into the airport, to school, to work. If we did that, we could start to resume towards pre-COVID life. But unfortunately, we haven't made that a priority. It was ready to go in April, and here it is you know, pushing November. And we still don't have it. And these tests uh, will be a game changer once we get there. And I hope it'll be soon. Absolutely. You're absolutely right. Now, in the U.S., we are hearing about overwhelmed hospitals in places like Wisconsin and Utah. What can we do to, to weather this coming crisis as we head into the winter here in the U.S. and globally? Well, we should have the rapid test by now, and that requires the FDA to develop a separate path so they don't hold them hostage to the traditional PCR tests that require the deep nasopharyngeal swab. These are done, you know, just in the front of the nose or even saliva. So we need the FDA to help us here. Um, and we also need to scale that up because, you know, we at best are doing just over a million tests per day. And we called, as part of the Rockefeller Foundation Action Plan, we called for at least 7 million tests a day, seven times what we're doing right now. And so that's what we should be doing. But better than just having that number is distributing them to every household throughout the country. And they're so simple. I mean, you know, one line, you're not infectious, two lines, you are, stay home if you're infectious, and, and there you go. So there's a way out of this that's inexpensive and fast and practical, but we just haven't made it a priority. But in addition to that, Lisa, we're going to be wearing masks for all next year. That's the wake up call. All of 2021 is a mask year, and we need to make a universal mask mandate because just because we have vaccines, which fortunately we're going to have, that doesn't mean we are uh, ready to uh, take this virus, uh, you know, as far as not seriously. In fact, it will take the vast majority of the population to be immunized before we can start to let up on mass. And that's going to take next year, fully next year. So people think. Yeah, and it's just, it's such a, it's such a good. minor, yeah, yeah, it's such a minor inconvenience, but yet, you know, there's just this, this abject refusal to, to wear them in so many parts of this country and including, you know, in our leadership. Uh, Dr. Topol, I, I have some questions rolling in from people who are watching right now. Uh, Joanne from LinkedIn asks, with fatality rates going down and more cases spreading, what are the dangers of coming in contact with someone who has previously tested positive? Well, I think the idea, uh, well, a reinfection, uh, if we get to that, it's very, very uh, rare. That is, in all these 40 million cases that you mentioned, we only have less than 30 reinfections fully documented. 
and that requires having the genomic sequencing of the virus from the first infection separated by some months of the second infection. The two uh, sequences are not the same. And so, yes, there's probably more than 30 if you add people who didn't get that type of assessment, but still, it's very rare. So once you get through this, I mean, that's where you, Lisa, having had it, you've developed a good, I'm sure, antibody response. The chance of you getting a second infection is incredibly remote, at least for the next year. The question we don't know at this point, because this is a new illness, is how long do you, are those uh, antibodies and B and T cells going to last? How long, how good is their memory in 2022 when this virus is still around if you didn't have a vaccine? That's the question. So, you know, well, we well, don't Dr. know. So, so yeah, I, I, I didn't, I, I actually didn't get COVID. I was exposed to someone oh, and I, I quarantined. But, but, ah. but that, that brings me to another question, though. Do people who have already had COVID, should they also comply with the mask orders or, 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 or wear masks? Yeah I'm, yeah, I'm sorry for that. I mistook. Uh, it's, I had okay. A <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Intro there. Um, no, no I think it's here. Yeah, it's clear that uh, we all should be wearing masks, and for different reasons. One, one is that just because you, even if you have a vaccine, even if you get monoclonal antibody, you can still have the virus in your nasal mucosa and spread it to other people. So that's, I think, something that's really important to keep in mind is that st we don't achieve sterilization immunity with vaccines or with monoclonal antibodies, which are very potent. So. You, you can still infect other people. So, you know, I, the masks are essential. And, you know, why isn't this a mandate? We have seatbelts that are mandated. And, you know, for, when that started, people didn't want to wear seatbelts. And then it became the law. And if you didn't wear them, you would be fined. Well, it's the same darn thing. And we have to make it the law. And we have to be serious about this. Otherwise, we're never going to get control. And unlike Europe, uh, which did, by and large, you see they're starting out almost down to zero, getting, you know, in a very tough zone right now. We follow them by weeks. That's what happened the first wave. So we're going to go from where we are right now, 80-some thousand. We may well go at 120 or 1,000 or more per day. And you know that's going to result in some people dying and a lot of hospitals that are going to get crunched. Such an important message. I have one more question. Uh, Sen from LinkedIn asks, I heard that recent COVID symptoms do not show body temperature. How do we identify in that case? I mean, yeah, you know, there's so many places where they're taking fevers, but but, yeah, but you may this, you this may is, still be positive if you don't have a fever. Exactly, Lisa. So you, the, there's no reason to take temperature. It, it's just not at all helpful, really. Um, so it, it, this is crazy stuff. I have all these employers. It's like a placebo. They take temperature of their employees, and then, you know, they tell them you're good to go. Well, it's, they, have, they have no idea whether they have infection that they can, uh, asymptomatic that they can transmit. And in the pre-symptomatic time, when there's no fever, that's actually is a, a peak time of being able to infect others. So, you know, what we really need are these rapid tests, as mentioned, because taking temperature is terribly insensitive it's inaccurate for its its um, objective. The only thing that is very specific is loss of smell and taste. If you've lost smell and taste, and it's not with congestion, that was that's about as solid a sign there is. But outside of that, there, there are no other symptoms that say you've got COVID, especially fever. That doesn't work. Dr. Eric Topol, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Such important information. We really appreciate it and hope you'll come on with us again. Terrific. Thank you, Lisa. And that was Dr. Eric Topol. In case you're just joining us, this is The Road to a Vaccine, and we are talking to leading experts about the COVID-19 crisis. We are live and reading all your questions and comments, so keep sending them along, and we'll try to get them answered. Our next guest is Dr. Mathai Mammon. He is the global head of R&D at Johnson & Johnson, and uh, he's here with updates on how their global clinical trials uh, are working, and there's still so much to talk about, so I want to welcome him back today. Uh, Dr. Mammon, thank you so much for joining us. It's been a little while. Uh, after 11 days, I understand that uh, the pause 
in J&J's trial has been lifted and you are resuming clinical trials. So what happens now? How many centers are open uh, and, and where are they and how many patients will be tested? I know that, that, that that's a lot of questions, but I think people are just so curious about what the, the, the continuation is going to look like. Yeah, thanks for the question, Lisa. First, thank you uh, for having me again. It's great to see you. Uh, it's been about a month, and um, over that month, a lot has happened. Um, so to answer your question directly, at this point, we uh, start right where we left off. We're recruiting in uh, many centers. There, there, we have a centralized uh, process for uh, approving any kind of protocol changes. So we've made the minor wording changes that we needed to that resulted from the, the pause, and uh, we're, we're going. And so we have uh, a large number of sites, uh, over 80 right now in the United States. We have sites open and recruiting in, in South Africa. Uh, there are a number of uh, countries in South America, from Peru, Argentina, Brazil, uh, others that are imminently uh, going to be recruiting either late this week or early next week. So super excited about the, the momentum we're, we're generating right now. So excited to get some data ultimately. I know the plan is to ultimately uh, test about 60,000 people. Um, do, do you know how many people so far have, have gotten injected? Uh, it's what, what happens in a study like this is you head to uh, a, a number in and around a couple thousand, uh, and then you pause for a little bit of time just to make sure everything is good to go. And so we're coming up on that pause, and then we, we go recruit the, the, the remainder at a faster clip than we can prior to this, uh, this uh, normal routine process in a clinical trial. It's called a safety pause, and it's true for all the trials across the board. Um, you talk about all of the testing centers around the world, and, and I know that you're making great efforts to recruit diverse populations for your clinical trials. Why is that so critical? So this is not different for vaccines as it, is, as it is for any of our therapeutics or other vaccine programs. We always had the intent of recruiting into a phase three registrational trial, um, the same mix of people that we want to use that medicine or vaccine for in the real world post-approval. So um, it's really important that we do that for the vaccine too. We have, uh, everyone is susceptible to this virus. I think I, I wanna make that very clear. There's no one that's completely protected. There are some populations and subpopulations that are especially prone to either an infection or a bad outcome of an infection. So we need to have everybody represented um, and we can't miss out on any of the subpopulations that we feel are especially important, that are especially susceptible or prone to a bad outcome. So diversity for us is, is job one. Um, we work really hard at it. I think, I'd say we pulled out all the stops for um, gaining uh, relationships, trusting relationships with every community, every patient phenotype, every comorbidity that matters to us as we enroll this study in as complete and thorough as, uh, a way as we possibly can manage. Uh, Dr. Mema, what, um, what kinds of communities would you say are particularly susceptible? So if you have um, immune compromise of any sort, like if there's something up with your immune system, that's uh, clearly gonna be a population that's at risk. Uh, with age, Sometimes um, for many, many of us with age, especially very like over 65, over 75, over 80, the immune system is not quite as robust as when we're 18. And so the elderly are a particularly important population. Um, certain ethnicities, the Latinx population, the African-American community in the United States, um, and there are various communities globally like this as well, where um, for reasons that may be complex, there seems to be an increased susceptibility. So every one of those populations across the board are important to include for us so that we can tell when our vaccine, that our vaccine works as well in all these various uh, populations and communities. We have a question from Martha from Facebook who asks, where are you recruiting in the US? So it's literally all over the place. There's a few places that we've excluded. Um, what we did, and I think we talked about this last time, Lisa, was 
we went through a very extensive process of predicting where the virus was going to be. We conducted, we constructed with uh, colleagues at MIT, with our data science group, a model that uh, would project where the, the um, pandemic would uh, wax and wane. And we would like to go as a company to places where there's waxing going on. There's uh, like lots of incidents happening. And um, you know, the good news is that we've been largely correct about where we've projected uh, some of the increased incidents. And so we literally are everywhere. We're across the southern parts of the United States. We're in the, in the north. We're in California on the West Coast. Um, we have sites that are, that are sort of test sites in other places as well. Our plan is not every one of these sites is going to, um, it's going to be equally desirable to recruit large numbers. So we, we monitor this at a, at a very granular, granular level and, you know, pump the brakes and press on the accelerator at places where we're maximizing uh, recruitment of the right populations and are seeking um, out places where the incidence is sufficient for us to be able to collect a signal of efficacy in not too long a time. Well, there certainly is a lot of virus spreading in so many parts of, of this country. Yeah. Um, so, so no need to really chase too far, sadly. No. Um, no. We, we have a question from uh, Vishwas from LinkedIn who's asking, what are the causes of a second wave of COVID in some countries? Yeah, so it would be the same set of reasons as it would, it would occur anywhere in any city or any state. Um, the virus does not seem to have changed. So we, we're looking, multiple groups are sequencing all the time. Um, I think what's changing is that we as human beings, uh, I think we grow weary of some of the, the uh, requirements for masks and social distancing. And it doesn't take a lot. There's a positive feedback cycle to this. So if a few people are not careful and they become spreaders in the community again, and uh, people aren't quite as cautious as they should be or supposed to be, then uh, things can exponentially get worse. And so we see that manifest as a second wave. And so personally, I think that's what's happening in a multiple, multiple countries, multiple regions within countries. Dr. Mammon, Mike from LinkedIn is asking, what is your advice on how we can stay safe and he healthy until a vaccine is approved? So it's the same almost now boring advice that we've been hearing from everywhere. We have to wear masks. Uh, we should social distance. We shouldn't gather in large groups um, in the absence of mas masks. Uh, we should be we should be generally cautious about this is an this is a very infectious uh, virus. So just act at accordingly. And I see lots of instances where people are not. Um, and I feel like uh, we would be better off if there was some mandate, some uh, national mandate right now for certain behaviors, that there isn't as much uh, choice in the system. It's not a terribly big inconvenience to, to abide by the rules we're supposed to. That's right. That's exactly what Dr. Eric Topol was was just saying, that there should be a mandate here, uh, but you have to have leadership that uh, that promotes that idea. Um, why, uh, Dr. Mammon, is it important to be educating people about vaccinations right now? Yeah, so that's a really, really important question. I think that is something that the, the world and the United States in particular, where there's some level of hesitancy, needs to happen. The First, there are several parts to that. One is, I think people in general um, would, would benefit from understanding the extreme rigor and extreme scientific um, nature of the process by which we're producing a vaccine. Nothing is left un, undiscussed or unexplored. There's no piece of safety that's not um, being, being looked at very, very carefully. Um, I personally would never, in my, in my, given the mission I have in my life for producing uh, therapeutics and vaccines that really influence the health of humanity, I would never allow anything to go past me that is not, uh, that is not proven efficacious and safe. So, and companies in general are populated with such people. So I think conveying what actually happens among the people that are making active decisions, I think would be 
a really important thing. And, you know, being on what you're doing right now, Lisa, and having people on, I think conveys that spirit that people have that are trying to develop and deploy, deploy medicines and vaccines. So that's number one. Number two is that um, when, uh, like, there's a long history of vaccines and some misinformation, I would choose this moment in time of readdressing some of that and making more definitive statements because the, such definitive statements are now possible with the large number of vaccines that exist uh, in the world and been being used safely for a long time. So those two things, I would, uh, I would definitely push and convey to start to gain the trust of the, the community. There are other things that I think are helpful by having, having individuals that are trusted within local communities speak on behalf of the importance of uh, vaccinating oneself. Let's say this does not work, that there's not the right level of trust, uh, there's too much hesitancy and people refuse to take vaccines, we could be in the same state we're in right now for a long time and no one wants that. Yeah, I mean, if you think that that, that this has already been a long time, uh, you know, it, 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 we could be in this for, for far, far longer. I don't think people really grasp that. Um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Mathai Mammon, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. We know you have a really packed schedule, so we so appreciate your insights always. Thank you. I appreciate the time. Thank you. Now, one perspective we don't hear enough of is that of nurses. During COVID, nurses have been on the front lines innovating and adapting to administer science-based interventions with limited resources, while oftentimes being the sole source of human connection for critically ill patients without loved ones around to comfort them. For more on what's happening on the front lines, we have an exceptional ER nurse and clinical nurse specialist in Los Angeles, California, treating patients in some of the most challenged areas. Nurse Alice Benjamin, thank you so much for being with us today. Now, as, a, as an emergency room nurse, what has your experience been like dealing with COVID-19 patients? And what's it like for frontline workers in the ER right now? Are you seeing a lot of new cases lately? Yes, yeah, so um, on the front lines in the emergency room, the best way I can describe this to people is like riding the biggest and steepest roller coaster uh, with the sharpest turns and the, the deepest drops blindfolded because the thing about the emergency room is care has always been unpredictable in the emergency room but now you add the layer of COVID-19 and it's been uh, very challenging uh, while patients do come in sporadically sometimes they're you know we, we get groups of them who are very sick and we're having to respond on top of other emergencies such as someone having a heart attack or a stroke now we complicate that with an infectious disease process and, you know, a lot has changed about how we do things in the emergency room. Uh, you know, wearing masks, respirators, you can see us in biohazard suits and masks. That has become an everyday part of our attire. How we do things in the emergency room, how we're very particular about isolating and moving people who may have the symptoms or suspect they have COVID-19. So we've had to rearrange our processes, our locations in the emergency room, um, and, you know, Lisa, I have to say, we're doing our best every day. And, you know, we signed up for this and we care about people. Um, but this is similar to running a marathon with short sprints within, within the race. And, you know, there's already a shortage of healthcare providers. We're doing our best, but we're, we're get, beginning to get fatigued um, in, in the emergency room in the front lines. But, you know, we're doing our best. And what we really are hoping to have is, you know, the public to partner with us. So when people come into the emergency room, you know, we're having them wear masks. So we make it a universal practice to wear masks. We're screening at entrances. We're having people wait in separate areas if we believe they may have COVID-19. We're cleaning and disinfecting our equipment even more and also in the waiting area. And, you know, nurses are very creative. We've created processes in the emergency room. For example, the IV pumps that, you know, are next to a patient's bedside as they're getting medications to decrease the spread of infection, we as nurses came up with this idea like, well, let's make the tubing a little bit longer so we can stretch the machine so they're outside the door so we're not in and out, potentially increasing the risk of exposure. So this is definitely a, a moment in time where our healthcare system, our knowledge and our skills are being challenged and we're rising to the occasion, but you know, it's not without its challenges. And Alice, you've been on the front line since the beginning. How have treatments changed since the start of this crisis? 
Well, at the beginning of this crisis, it was mass hysteria. Uh, you know, lots of people coming in with cough, cold, uh, fever, and, you know, for the most part, from what we study in healthcare and medicine, you know, it may present as a pneumonia or uh, a pulmonary infection. So we kind of have our to-do list of things and treatments that we can uh, uh, prescribe for a patient. But what we were discovering is that it wasn't working. People were getting very sick. They were going into respiratory failure at accelerated speeds. They were presenting in uh, septic, septic uh, situations. Their other chronic medical conditions were exacerbating. And so that was something we weren't prepared for. So we did what we could um, early on in the pandemic, but what we've learned over the past few months is that you know we've we've instituted remdesivir, we've inst uh, which is an antiviral medication which is now FDA approved. We've instituted um, other steroids to decrease inflammation. Uh, uh, Decadron is one of the medications. We've also added other medications which have, even if they were small studies, have been shown to be helpful because at this point we're just trying to do what we can to help each patient. So while um, you know, thimetidine, which is an anti-ulcer, anti-acid medication. There are small studies that have shown that it can help uh, alleviate some of the symptoms of COVID. Now, so we're 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 pulling out everything that we have because um, in this situation, COVID-19 has shown us that it's not a disease process that follows a particular algorithm. It does what it wants to do. So at this point, we've been doing everything and anything we can to take care of patients, um, provided that it's safe. Uh, Alice, there, there is much more that is known about the virus. You, you talk about the different treatments that are now available, and, and the death rate uh, has gone down. And so there are a lot of people who are just not taking this virus as seriously. As I mentioned, where I was in Oklahoma, there were so many people who just refused to wear masks. So can you speak to those people who are not taking this virus seriously? I mean, we are, we're seeing surges in places like Wisconsin and Utah and hospitals that are overwhelmed uh, and over capacity. So what would you say to those people who are who, who say, oh, deaths have come down and, and, and there's a 90 percent, you know, 95 percent survival rate for COVID? What would you say to them? I would say even one death is one too many and that we really need to partner uh, the public and the healthcare institutions need to partner together. It doesn't matter what we do in the hospital, what we can provide and what we can offer. If the public doesn't take the steps to prevent infection, we will continue to overwhelm our healthcare systems and people will continue to get sick and die. And what we do know is that masks, I mean, masks are very simple, simple, easy thing to wear. And so that small ounce of prevention can really mean saving the life of not only yourself, but of your loved ones, your friends and community members. And what I think people don't realize is they hear numbers are coming down, but they're still very high. I have to be quite candid, and I know numbers are changing constantly every day, but what we do know is that, and especially in people of color, uh, Hispanics, Blacks, um, and Native Americans, they are having more cases, they are still having more higher rates of hospitalization and higher rates of death compared to white Americans. And I think that people are getting maybe a little piece of information and they're generalizing it, and that just isn't the case. COVID is still here. Um, it's a little bit like fighting an invisible man because we know it's there. We know that it can take us out, but and we're still trying to wrap our arms around it in this fight. And especially as we're entering into our winter months, the weather's going to get cooler. People are going to want to be inside. That means you're going to be in close contact with people. And you couple COVID-19 with potential flu virus that's out there. Um, both of those have very similar symptoms. And so we're really concerned that we're going to be hitting a, what we're uh, calling a twindemic. And unless the public wears their mask, social distance, you know, washes their hands and do all of the things that they can do to prevent this, we're still going to be uh, in trouble. And hopefully um, the public, you know, listens and they do their part to help um, fight off the COVID-19 pa um, pandemic. Yeah, I mean, masks can can, can help to combat uh, the spread of the flu as well. So for, for a myriad of reasons, uh, it's beneficial to mm -hmm. wear masks. Uh, Alice, I have a question from uh, Thomas from mm -hmm. LinkedIn who asks, uh, how are frontline workers prepared to support another wave? Oh wow! So that is a that's a great question. And you know what? We're we're we've learned a lot since this since the pandemic started. So I do want to say that we've learned a lot. We've changed processes, and we're we're doing better. Uh, but the problem is we don't 
have enough health care providers out there. And just like the general public gets sick, we have, I have coworkers who've uh, uh, been sick and infected with COVID-19. And unfortunately, I do know of coworkers who've died from COVID-19. So uh, we, we are doing our best. We've actually elicited and we're partnering with schools of medicine, nursing schools, and we're actually in some programs accelerating programs to get more front uh, frontline healthcare providers to help us in this fight. And, you know, but again, I cannot emphasize how important and how critical it is for communities to do their part. I know you're not a, a you may not be a doctor, you may not be a physician, but you absolutely can help us in the fight against COVID-19 at the front line. Yeah, to me, that's the biggest reason to be concerned. You know, when the hospital systems become overwhelmed, if you have any yes. other ailment that's going to prevent you from being able to get treated if hospitals uh, are, are over capacity with COVID patients. I mean, that that's something that, mm -hmm. that I think really needs to sink in with people because that is where everybody is, you know, becomes a, at risk. Um, Alice, what are some of the the, the most common misconceptions about vaccines that you're hearing from patients. Um, are you seeing a lot of vaccine hesitancy and, and what would you say needs to be done to address that? Absolutely. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of hesitancy with vaccine. I mean, if you think about this, less than half of Americans got the flu vaccine, right? And we know we have a lot of information, a lot of data about the flu, yet many people were hesitant to get the flu vaccine. Now, when we have the discussions about uh, COVID-19 vaccine, there's a lot of hesitancy and for a variety of reasons. Um, and I always say also, especially in communities of color, which stems back from the Tuskegee syphilis study, but even outside of that, there's been bad experiences with people of color in healthcare, uh, in, in uh, disadvantaged communities. There's a lack of um, cultural competency in healthcare. Um, people just don't have access to good quality healthcare. And because of those bad experiences, they generalize it to all of medicine. And, you know, I've even heard of uh, vaccines causing autism, that this is a form of genocide. This is a form of the government wanting to control us. This is a form of them instilling disease in us. And so there's a lot of misconceptions out there. And what it's going to take is a lot of education, a lot of uh, education and build, rebuilding of trust uh, with communities. And some of how we do that is to increase the cultural competency of our healthcare providers, put more healthcare providers in, uh, small communities of color, um, also you know, have more forms like this. This is an excellent form to educate people. And I think people just need to be informed and not just run with the sound bites that they hear on the news, but take some time to have and what I call a living room language. Because in these conversations, we use a lot of big words, we use statistics, and that can be overwhelming. So health literacy also plays a role in whether uh, Americans uh, believe or can even understand what we're saying. But um, you know, I'm really going to encourage people that when a vaccine does become available, that we're going to need to take it if we plan to really get on the other side of this thing, because it does us no good if we're able to have the science, the scientists and the, you know, the medical providers, we have a vaccine, but if no one uses it and no one takes it, it does us no good. And we really need a bulk of Americans to take the COVID-19 vaccine in order to provide, uh, you know, immunity uh, and to get through this. Such crucial themes that uh, that have um, been threaded throughout this episode. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nurse Alice Benjamin. We so appreciate um, you being with us, but also exercising your voice in such an important way. Um, if, if we can help amplify that, um, we really want to continue to do so. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lisa. Now let's turn our attention to the UK, where coronaviruses are rising again. We talked to Calum O'Dwyer, a COVID patient advocate in Scotland, about what it's been like to live with COVID for six months and how he's trying to change the situation for others like him. Quite dramatically, it was the 23rd of March, which was the first day in the UK of lockdown. It was that day that I woke up not feeling very well, overwhelmed with 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 uh, fever with heat and i also had uh, shortness of breath but on two occasions so bad that i had to call the uh, helpline service for the for the health healthcare service here they basically assessed me over the phone and said we don't think that you need to come in uh, into the hospital those two weeks of the virus were, were bad and then for another three weeks or so i was just racked with very intense post-viral fatigue and weakness you know, waking up gasping, 
I just, you know, I've been having auditory and visual hallucinations in the middle of the night when you're in a flat by yourself thinking, you, you know, you could die still. I have some friends who run a politics website. I was asked on as a, as a guest. It caught the attention of a journalist for the, for the BBC who had me on her radio show and it got written up as an online article and then it exploded. There were all of these people who were terrified, who were scared, who didn't feel like their experience was being reflected anywhere. So really from that point, I realized it was a really important cause to keep speaking up about. And over time, that kind of recognition and that awareness has gone up. One of the more surreal moments of my life, a video I did for local news, which was then run across the whole of Scotland um, on, on social media, got viewed, retweeted by the First Minister of Scotland, uh, Nicola Sturgeon. I kind of feel like it's something that I don't have a choice whether to campaign or not over, really. It's something I have to do. This problem isn't just medical, it's political. We have a lot of the apparatus in place, it's just a case of funding. It's just a case of the political will to make that happen. Unfortunately, that's not the conversation people want to have right now. You can judge a society by the way it treats its most unfortunate. And I think at the moment, our society is, 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 falls well short, well short. Such powerful words. Thank you so much, Kalem. It's really incredible to see survivors advocating for others. I want to thank all of our guests uh, for being on the show today and to all of you for watching. If there's anyone you'd like to see on the show, just drop it in the comment section and we'll do our best to try to secure them. We will see you on November 10th on the road to a vaccine. Have a great day. Alice, thank you so much for hanging with us. Really, really appreciate it. And really hope to, to, to have you on the show again. You're fantastic and such a such an important voice right now to hear from people, you know, directly on the front lines. You know, I think we we just we forget and we don't think about where this, you know, this the 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 biggest sort of um concern, right, is 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 in our uh healthcare and hospital systems. Thank you.